Cinematography, the art of making motion pictures. Cinematographers are the visual artists behind the movies that spark our emotions and capture our imaginations. Though cinematography and photography share a lot of the same traits, some of the techniques that are used in lighting motion pictures are quite different than what photographers have been taught over the years. My name is Joel Dreyer, founder of Digital Bray Studios, and in this training series, we are going to look at how to light a scene using some of the techniques that cinematographers use when lighting a motion picture. The difference is, as where cinematographers use continuous lights, we will primarily be using strobes. However, these techniques can easily be applied using continuous lights as well. I assure you that this will be unlike any training video you have ever watched before. We want to challenge your way of thinking and open your eyes to new possibilities as you begin to light your own cinematic scenes. With that being said, let's get started. Michael Goy, a cinematographer who has worked on many TV shows including Salem, American Horror Story, and Glee, once said that there is no such thing as bad lighting. As a photographer, this might shock you. After all, this lighting is pretty horrific. But if I was in a movie, let's say a horror or a suspense movie, and I was about to kill someone, this kind of lighting would fulfill an emotional purpose, wouldn't you say? It is essentially making me look menacing or frightening. The fulfilling and emotional purpose is the key here. When lighting your scene, think of a story and emotion you're trying to convey. Does your scene convey loneliness, tension, or suspense? Or does it need to feel happy, lighthearted, or have a sense of romance? Whatever that feeling, as long as your light effectively expresses it, there's no bad lighting. So what is your photo story? This will be the basis and the cornerstone on which we build our photograph. Now that you have decided on the story and the emotion of your photograph, the next step is to use the four basic elements of lighting to make that emotion come to life. These elements are the color, the intensity, angle, and quality of the light. By asking yourself how these four elements can be adjusted to fit the mood of your story, you will find that you will be able to transfer that image out of your brain and into the real world more easily. Not to mention being able to light your scene a lot faster. The first element is pretty self-explanatory, the color of the light. As mentioned before in our searcher scene, we are going to create two different looks, a nighttime look and a daytime look. Both looks will rely heavily on the use of different colors of light. The second element is the intensity of the light. In our first setup, the overall intensity of the light will be very low to reflect nighttime. Now in our day setup, the overall light will be a lot harsher and more blown out. Our third element is the angle of the light. As we build the lighting for each of our scenes, we hope to stretch and provoke your thinking when it comes to lighting for an emotional purpose. Rembrandt and butterfly lighting are great and have their place, but do they best convey the emotion of your scene? Our fourth and final element is the quality of the light. Basically, the quality of your light is how soft or how hard your light is. Soft light has a more gradual edge fall off from the highlights to the shadows while hard light has a sharper edge fall off. Remember this though, soft light does not necessarily mean low contrast. A large source placed close to the subject has a gradual edge fall off, but the ratio between the highlight and the shadow can be quite significant. Now that you know the basic four elements of light, keep them in the back of your mind whenever you approach a new location or a scene. Let's now apply what we have learned as we journey to our abandoned basement where a lone figure lurks searching intently for something that will change the world forever. Okay, so here we are on our searcher set with all the lights turned on. As you can see, it doesn't look like much right now, but soon we're gonna turn it into a nighttime and a daytime look. Now, as discussed before, let's go over our four elements of light. Now, our first element is going to be color. And as far as color temperature goes, uh, we're using a mixture of uh, strobes and continuous lights. Uh, our practicals in the background are desk lamps. Uh, those are all tungsten balanced and our strobes are daylight balanced. Now, again, as far as color, we want our moonlight to be a nice cool blue. To do that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna tungsten balance our camera. Now that's gonna take our, our practicals and turn them into a white light. And it's gonna take our daylight balance strobes and make uh, the light coming out from them, it's gonna be real blue. 
As far as our intensity of light, again, since it's nighttime, it's gonna be pretty low intensity. We're gonna have uh, some fill bounce that's gonna provide a directionless fill that's going to bring up the shadows a, a little bit. But as far as the overall intensity of light, it, it's gonna be pretty dark, pretty low key shot. Now for our angle of light, there's gonna be a couple of different angles. The key on our subject is going to look like it's coming from our practical lamps, both on the left and uh, behind him. I place the practicals uh, in a place so that we can uh, do a short light on the side of his face from, from this lamp. And we're also going to have kind of a kicker backlight uh, effect uh, for this uh, lamp behind him. And I say effect because the light's actually not gonna be coming from the actual practical lamps themselves. We're actually going to simulate that light uh, by placing other lights and uh, flagging them so that they hit them and it actually looks like the light is coming from the lamp when in fact it is not. Our moonlight is gonna be coming in from camera left and it's gonna be putting some nice little shadows and dappled moonlight on our back uh, wall. Finally, the quality of light for our scene. The quality is gonna be pretty harsh as far as there's not gonna be a lot of softness to the light. There's not gonna be a lot of a gradual fall off between uh, highlight and shadow. Now I wanna take you to each light and show you what it is doing in the scene. And I also want to show you what we did to take away light from the scene to make it more dramatic. So follow me and we'll go and I'll show you our main light that's providing our moonlight for the scene. All right, this is our key light. Well, I now have a travel light 750, uh, 750 watt seconds, and it's dialed down to about uh, 130 second power. We're shooting at uh, ISO 400 F4 at a 30th of a second for the shot. Remember what I said about it being uh, daylight balanced. Since we're tungsten balanced, it's really gonna be really saturated blue. Uh, acting as moonlight and the blue is fine but we wanted to tone down the blue a little bit we wanted to make it a cool light but not so blue it looked almost theatrical so what we did here is we have a piece of uh, half CTO so it's going to warm up the blue light a, a little bit in the color temperature it's going to warm it up a little bit but it'll still be cooler than our tungsten light uh, from our practicals and one neat little thing here is this is called a multi-clip and this is great for adding makeshift barn doors. You can cut out pieces of black uh, foam board or cardboard, and uh, or you can clip gels to pretty much any reflector of, of, of any light. And uh, you can also use gaff tape too, but in this case we're using a multi-clip to uh, easily clip the gel to the light, and it's easily removable as well. Now this light is going to, I'm gonna show you how it's gonna rake across the scene and we actually have some flags. Remember what I said about adding light and taking away light. Cinematographers uh, like to say a lot of times, it's not so much what uh, you add, but what you take away. And that really holds true. And being able to flag the light and take away the light on different parts of the scene can make all the difference in the world. And you'll see that in just a second as I show you how this is flagged and how it affects the scene. Now the angle you're viewing at now is the back side of the light I just showed you, our main uh, key light for the moonlight. Now, what you see behind me are two flags, one diffusion material and one solid black flag. And you can see right in between here, what we're doing is we are shining our moonlight through this open area here and it's skirting uh, through the bookshelf. Now what this diffusion material is doing is there's a part in the picture where the brick wall was a little too hot and we didn't want the, the viewer's eye to go to that spot. But we still wanted you to, to be able to see the, uh, the detail in the brick. So instead of just go ahead and just cut it right off the, uh, the wall completely, we added this piece of diffusion material and it allows some light to come through and basically uh, it serves as almost a fill light for that little space of wall and just brings out the texture in the brick. This black panel is masking the light and flagging the light from hitting our model. We wanted it to shine through the bookcase and put some neat sh uh, shadows on the wall, but we didn't want it to really uh, pollute our, our talent. So there's a lot of uh, things going on here with these two flags. So again, it's, it's so important, not just what you add to a scene, but what you take away as far as light goes. 
and you do that through the use of flags. This light right here is doing something really important. It's actually emulating the light from one of our practical lights that's on uh, particularly the desk lamp that's on our desk. As cinematographers, a lot of times the practical lamps aren't bright enough or don't give the desired uh, light on the subject uh, that the cinematographer wants. In that case, we uh, simulate the light coming from that practical. Uh, this light right here, we're actually booming and shooting over our bookcase and we're raking it across our subject to look like he is being lit from the practical lamp that is on the desk. There's a lot happening with this light though, so the light's not just spilling all over the place. For stars, we have a 20 degree grid uh, that's inserted into the reflector to control the spill of light. But even that was hitting the top of our bookcase and uh, it was uh, casting light into other places of the scene that we didn't want. So using the multi-clips that I showed you on that last light, we took some pieces of a black poster board and made some makeshift barn doors. And we were able to use two multi-clips and we were able to flag the light and cut the light like using barn doors off uh, of the top of the bookcase and uh, other places where we didn't want the light. This little guy right here on the background stand is our other moonlight and it's our moonlight fill. And just like our other moonlight, it has a half CTO on it which will warm it up just a little bit, but it'll still feel like cool moonlight compared to our full-blown tungsten white balance that we have set on our camera to uh, match our practicals. Now we are feathering this and shooting it off this beadboard right here. Now cinematographers call this beadboard, but all it really is is uh, styrofoam or polystyrene. And the reason they like to use this as fill is instead of like a white foam core, uh, which actually has a little bit of specular uh, specularity to it, this beadboard is textured, so it casts light all over the place. So for fill, it is an excellent, excellent tool to use. Now, they use like four foot by eight foot sheets of this stuff, and they have access to it in larger cities, but if you don't live in a large city, it can be really expensive to ship it to you. What I did was I went down to Lowe's and uh, they have in their insulation section these uh, polystyrene panels and they're about four feet by 13 inches and what i did was i bought a packet of that a pack of that it was about ten dollars ten or eleven dollars and i had some uh, scrap cardboard that i just used uh, elmer's glue wall and i put the panels on there and glued them down and wrapped gaff tape around to make this board that you see here. It is a wonderful, wonderful uh, bounce fill and it's very directionless. At the opposite end of the beadboard bounce, we just placed a simple piece of foam core to act as a flag so that the uh, spill and the excess light was blocked from the camera lens. So that's all this flag is doing. But a quick cool tip is you can easily use foam core instead of a more expensive uh, flag just by buying an accessory fork. An accessory fork is like a little pitchfork that you can stick up to, I think, a three foot by four foot piece of foam into and then attach it to your mini boom arm and put it on a light stand. It's a lot less expensive than uh, buying a, uh, a full blown uh, black flag. You can also use a white piece of foam core for bounce. One tool cinematographers love to use is a constant light source called a source for ellipsoidal or LECO. It's commonly used in stage production but uh, cinematographers started using because of just the, the massive amount of control you have in shaping the light. The reason you're able to shape the light so effectively is it is actually kind of like a spotlight in the fact that it has lenses in the lens barrel. Now this is a 36 degree uh, lens barrel, but you can, uh, once you buy the unit, you can also buy like a 19, a 26, a 50. I think they even have a five or 10 degree uh, spot. It's massive, but it'll make just a really tight beam of light. And what makes this light so cool is the fact that you can focus the light and also it has some internal shutters where you can actually cut the light. They're like internal flags, if you will. So to effectively flag a normal light, I'd have to have four flags and using the Source 4 without setting up any extra stands or anything, I can effectively uh, flag the light using the four shutter blades. Another cool thing about this light is uh, since you can focus it, it has a hold for gobos. 
so you can project dappled patterns on the walls or window blinds. Uh, the Roscoe makes a whole bunch of little steel gobos that you can put in here and you can uh, put projections on walls. Uh, so that really makes it neat. Now for this scene, what we needed to use the source for was, is we needed to shoot across the set without uh, spilling light onto the desk and the actor and, and so forth. Uh, we had already covered one side of the lamp uh, from our camera left side behind the bookcase uh, that was hitting our actor. Again, that light was coming from over the bookcase and striking our subjects, uh, acting as a key light on our subject. But for the other side of the light, uh, in our shot, it was just dead. But in real life, there would actually be some light spill from the uh, practical lamp hitting the bookshelf. So what we did, we were able to rake some light across this scene, uh, shutter it off, and defocus the beam a little bit. And uh, it was a little too bright, so we put some ND filters on the uh, end of our source forward here, which knocked it down. I think uh, we used two sets of ND, so it knocked it down about four stops in brightness, uh, just to add just a little subtle glow. But uh, using ND filters, we didn't change the color temperature uh, of the uh, light itself. This is our final light that we're using to simulate the light coming off of our practicals. This light right here is acting in part of our background practical. Uh, we needed some light uh, to hit the back locker back there. Without this light, it pretty much went black. But uh, doing that, again, we're shooting a cross set. We didn't want to, to uh, pollute our scene and to strike too much light on our talent. So what we did was, again, we put up another flag, a foam core flag here, and uh, we flagged the bottom part of uh, the light. We just basically turned the modeling light on, really turned the lights off, and look at the light, and uh, adjust the flag until it's right where we want it. There was one area of the picture that was still just going completely dark and uh, there was no detail in the shadows. And it was a shame because we had some cool little elements here. That was the bottom right portion of our picture. As you can see, we have some, some neat little pictures and an extra globe here and some books. And we wanted to, br again, bring that out of the shadows. So instead of placing another light, what we did was we just put a piece of white foam core right here and just propped it up with a sandbag and a, and a stick, basically. And, uh, what it, what's happening is, is our uh, beadboard bounce, that our, our moonlight beadboard bounce, the light is ricocheting off of that and hitting our uh, foam core right here and just illuminating this area just enough so that it registers on camera and it brings it out of the shadows. And it's uh, directionless too. Uh, it's real soft and subtle, but uh, in the final shot, you can see a, just a little bit more of uh, the detail in the bottom right uh, portion of the picture. Now that we've shot some pictures of our scene under our lighting setup, we're gonna add some diffusion. Now a cool little trick to use that cinematographers use is called netting. 
Now for 98 cents, you can go down to Walmart or another store and pick up some black sheer pantyhose. And I just cut some squares out of it. And uh, what you can do is you can stretch it over the front of your lens. Now cinematography lenses are a little different. Uh, they stick out more in the back. Uh, a lot of times they use uh, what they call a PL mount and they take a piece of snot tape, they call it, and they put the netting on the back element. But it's kind of hard to do that with uh, uh, SLR lenses. So we can put ours on the front lens and it still gives a real cool effect. But basically, once you put it over there, the, the lights and the highlights will bloom and flare and it gives a real neat effect, uh, often seen in Steven Spielberg movies. His cinematographer uses them. Uh, if you watch Minority Report or War of the Worlds, even uh, the new Indiana Jones movie, uh, you can see the bloom and the highlights, and that's because of uh, netting. But to the effect, you can adjust the effect by simply stretching the uh, netting over your lens. The more you stretch it, the thinner it gets and the less pronounced the blooming of the highlights is. Uh, the more you leave it kind of limp, the more it'll uh, bloom and so forth. But one thing to keep in mind is this will cut down on your exposure. Even stretched pretty tight, I have to up my ISO about two thirds of a stop. Okay, here we have a 3D representation of our scene with all the lights turned on. Let's turn them all off and focus on one light at a time. Okay, this is our key light for our scene, not to be confused with the key light for our model. The way I approached this scene was to look at the room as a subject in itself, with our moonlight acting as the main light lighting the room. From this perspective, you can see the light being diffused through one of our panels, the black flag blocking the light from hitting our talent, and the open area that allowed the raw light to shine through the bookcase and hit the back wall behind our model. This was the first light I set up. I took an incident meter reading at a point on the wall where the moonlight shone through the bookcase, and I used that as my base exposure of F4. I initially set my ISO at 400, knowing that I would need the extra sensitivity, since I would be mixing constant lights with strobes. Let's now take a look at our key light for our talent. This is the subject's key light and was made to look as if it was emanating from the light on the desk. I metered and set it the same as my base exposure at F4. For most of the shots, I had the model face towards camera left, towards the light. This was on purpose. Cinematographers often call this lighting upstage from the camera. As photographers, we call it short lighting. Short lighting not only adds depth and dimension, but it also adds drama to your picture, especially if there's a lot of contrast between highlight and shadow. Now keep an eye out next time you watch your favorite movie or TV show. Chances are that they are primarily using short lighting for most scenes involving close-ups. Now onto our beadboard bounce fill. I wanted the scene to be pretty contrasty, so I opted for a four to one ratio between the key and the fill four being four times brighter than the fill. Since one stop captures twice as much light, four times brighter would be two stops. So my fill read F2 on my light meter, or two stops less than my key light. Now I want you to notice the positioning of the light in relation to the panel. Since the board is angled, one side of the board is closer to the set than the other side. If we evenly illuminated the board, the camera left side of the set would be brighter than the camera right side but we wanted it to be evenly lit, so we attached a grid and feathered the light towards the far end of the board. The far end received more light, which had to travel a greater distance, while the side closer to the light received less light, but had to travel a shorter distance. The result is a more even distribution of light across the front of our scene. 
As we have already discussed, our Source 4 was used to emulate light coming from our desk lamp, providing a nice accent on our bookcase. You might have asked yourself why we do not use the Source 4 in place of our subject key light that was behind the bookcase, since we had to add both a grid and barn doors to control the spill of light. The reason is, is that in our original idea, we planned on having the Source 4 act as our key light coming in from a different angle, so we already had the bookshelf light in place. Here is a test shot using the Source 4 as the key for our subject. The idea was to have a gobode Source 4 act as moonlight shining through imaginary rafters. The light was shooting over the model's shoulder and bouncing dappled beams of light off the table and the maps, providing some passive fill on the face. Unfortunately, we were a bit limited on how far back we could place the light behind our model, due to the depth constraints of our set. After looking at the test shots, we decided to scrap the idea because we felt there was really no good point of reference that established where the light was originating from. It was looking a bit artificially lit. Right behind our Source 4 was the light we were using to cast a bit of extra light onto the locker area of our background. As mentioned before, it was made to look as if our background practical was illuminating it. The spill from the light also acted as a kicker fill for our subject, reducing the contrast on the shadow side of his face. The problem with this light was that it spilled over into parts of the desk where we did not want it to be. In addition, the intensity was more than what we wanted on our subject because the light was closer to our model in relation to the locker portion of the background. This brought the intensity of the shadow side of the face up too high. To reduce this, we added a flag to cut a bit of the light off our model while letting the majority of the light shine on the locker. As an added bonus, once the background practical light was turned on, the bulb emitted enough light to add a warm rim around the subject's hair as seen in these test shots. Finally, to top it all off, we added a piece of white foam core just out of frame so we could open up the shadows and bring out more of the detail in the pictures and the globe in the bottom right portion of the photo. We just finished our nighttime setup. Now let's take the same scene, flip it 180 degrees and create a daytime look using our four basic elements of light. Now for this next daytime scene, what we're going to do for our color is we're going to tungsten balance our light. And our main light is going to be our source four light. So our color of light, since we're being uh, tungsten balanced, we're going to put CTS color temperature straw gels on all our lights so that they are tungsten balanced as well. So the color of our light is going to be basically white daylight. Remember our second element of light is the intensity of light. Now, as the window was on one side of the set for our nighttime look, we're actually going to flip it and we're going to pretend there's a window on the opposite side of our scene for the daytime look. So being a harsh sunlight, the intensity is going to be real harsh and hard. As far as the angle of light, the main light source is basically going to be coming from up high and from camera right, coming down. And we're going to cut it with the source for uh, shutters so that and throw it a little bit out of focus so that there is a little bit of fall off on the harshness of that sunbeam. As far as the quality of light, since it's sunlight, we've already talked about the intensity being harsh. The uh, light is actually going to be real hard too. Now we're going to open up the scene with a bounce fill just like we did in the nighttime scene. But this time it's going to be a little warmer fill. And instead of using our beadboard, we're actually going to bounce uh, our light off of cardboard. And you'll see that in just a second. As a side note, in this next shot, we added a foreground element that wasn't in our nighttime scene. Since we're kind of in a basement uh, location, we figured we'd use this prop. We have this uh, metal column that's roughly about seven feet tall that we placed in the foreground of our picture. And it's out of focus and we raked just a little bit of light off of it. And it caught also from uh, the other side, it caught a little bit of light off our bounce. And it just added a little bit to the depth of the scene and kind of made it look like a support pillar of, of a industrial basement. So you'll see that in our next setup. Now the main magic light that we're going to be using for our sunlit look is the Source 4 once again. The Source 4 is really, really nice 
for a, a sunlight look since it actually uh, can produce parallel rays by uh, focusing the light. Now this is fitted with a 36 degree uh, lens tube and we kind of boomed it up high enough to bounce some light and rake some light across the scenes and across the maps. So uh, what we did was we kind of got it where we wanted it and at the top and the bottom we kind of cut the light some uh, so the top of our scene uh, kind of had a gradual fall off as well as the floor had a gradual fall off. We used the uh, shutters to do that and what we did was we uh, threw it out of focus so we'd have that nice little fall off. So that is what our key light's doing. As far as our camera settings, the main light here is about 15 to 20 feet from our table and our subject. Now that gives us about ISO 400 at a 30th of a second at f4 and uh, I'm shooting an 85 millimeter lens. Now I'll show you our fill light in just a second, but we have this set up right next to our key lights, so I wanted to go ahead and show it to you. Uh, it looks like a flag, but basically what we did was there was a, a part on the back wall that, uh, because it was such a harsh beam of, of sunlight, there were parts of the wall that were going black. And uh, this is a real neat way to, to add just kind of an organic dappled bit of specular highlights to uh, a dark wall. Uh, basically all that we have here is a mylar that's taped to black foam core and we just uh, cut it out with scissors and odd geometric shapes and then uh, uh, taped it onto the uh, foam core. And what you do is you uh, either turn your modeling light on or in our case a Source 4, you just point it at it and adjust it until the dappled pattern is w the way you like it. Now as far as where to buy mylar, I recommend getting a big sheet of it like this at your local Army Navy store or it might be at a sporting goods store as well. It, it comes in a form, it's called like an emergency or a solar blanket and it's a gigantic blanket of mylar. I picked mine up for about $3.99. So it's, it's really cheap and you get a whole lot of it and uh, besides that all you need is some foam core and tape and you're good to go. Surprise, surprise, we got another light within a, basically a six square foot space right next to our Mylar board bounce and our key light. And all this little guy is doing is it's raking a little bit of light off our foreground pillar just to, to simulate that this, the sunlight coming from our source four is actually hitting that foreground pillar. It's kind of providing a bit of a kicker for it. Now you might notice that we doubled up our CTS by folding it over here on the uh, hot shoe flash. And the reason we did that was our bounce source was actually casting a highlight on the opposite side of the pillar that was real warm. And remember I said we were using a cardboard bounce, which again we'll show you in a second. And it was causing a real warm highlight. On the other side, we wanted it to again look like sunlight, but it, the highlight was real cool with just the uh, one sheet of CTS. So again, we doubled it over, increased the exposure, and it warmed up that highlight on the uh, edge of the pillar. As I said before, we really only have two main lights for this whole setup. Uh, our third light is really just adding an accent to our uh, foreground pillar. Now we decided to add just a little bit of warmth to the fill, like there might be uh, another brick wall outside the frame that the light was bouncing off of and it was a warm brick wall so it would be casting uh, a warmth to the scene. So this is basically our, our, our beadboard that we used in our night shot and we flipped it over and as I said before I, I glued it to a cardboard backing. So it's nice and warm and brown so we were like why not just bounce some light off of it. And uh, this light is again fitted with CTS, uh, color temperature straw, and uh, cinematographers like to use CTS instead of CTO because it, it actually uh, is the same Kelvin difference. It actually lowers it to the same Kelvin as CTO, but it has a hint more of yellow than red in it. So it, it's more pleasing to skin tone. So they prefer to use CTS over CTO. So that's pretty much all the lights for our daytime setup. Now let's go ahead and shoot some pictures and see how it all comes together.
We just shot a few pictures using our new daylight setup. Now we're gonna add a source of diffusion to just take the digital edge off. And the way we're gonna do that is we're going to use a haze machine. Now a haze machine is a little different than using fog. Whereas fog just kind of emits a gigantic cloud of smoke at once, the haze machine kind of releases a finer mist over a longer period of time. It fills the room more and hangs around more than a fog machine, which just, again, releases a gigantic cloud and it just kind of drifts away. But with the haze, it kind of takes the digital edge off. It also possibly bring up the, the shadows a bit and uh, just giving it a more organic feel. So we're gonna run the hazer now and we're gonna take some pictures. The lighting's not changing. The only difference is there's a haze in the room. For our second look, we turned off all the practicals to establish that it was now day and our searcher did not have to use the lamps since he had the sun. This time we used our Source 4 as our main key light. The idea was to make the sunlight appear as if it was shining through a window off of camera right. The light was aimed at the maps on the table more than the subject. The goal was to provide some bounce fill from the light ricocheting off the maps. It was then finessed and flagged using the Source 4's internal shutters then slightly defocused to soften the edge falloff. An ambient light incident meter reading was taken about a foot above the table which gave me a reading of F4 at ISO 400 at 1 30th of a second. Notice how the light is hotter on the desk and then falls off rather rapidly. The model's face is more or less in the defocused edge of the beam, which in turn underexposes him. Cinematographers often simulate the behavior of natural light in everyday surroundings. In the case of the window, if a subject is standing a distance from a window, the shaft of light would most likely rake across the subject's body and never strike their face, unless it was just after sunrise or right before sunset. Our fill light placement was the same as our night setup, but we flipped the beadboard around and used the cardboard side as a bounce. It was metered at roughly two stops under our key at F2. By bouncing the light off the cardboard side, the fill added a rich and warm quality to the shadows of the scene. The reason the fill was placed below instead of higher up was to simulate how light would naturally fall and interact with the scene in real life. The natural sunlight would come down at an angle through the window, hitting various objects or other walls, then bounce back up into the scene. Our third light was not really a light at all. We needed to bring out the background just a hair, so we angled a piece of black foam core with pieces of mylar tape to it to reflect some dappled hot spots of light onto the wall. When adjusting the mylar flag, I tried to aim one of the hottest spots on the fan in the background because that was the area I was really wanting to bring out most. As far as the angle to the light, the mylar was at a pretty acute angle to maximize the brightness. This is something you just have to play with until you get the angle just right. Finally, we have our last light that is simply adding a bit of rim light to our foreground column from the direction of our imaginary window. Our day scene is a great example of why you do not have to have a ton of lights to light a scene. Placing the lights was relatively easy and fast. Most of the setup time was spent flagging and finessing the light. Hard light is a lot less forgiving than soft light, but unlike soft light that tends to go everywhere, hard light is a lot easier to control and can be just as beautiful. The hardest cinematic lighting is inspired by the light around us. Oftentimes as photographers, we just throw up a softbox in a scene and create a picture that looks lit instead of natural. Though there's nothing really wrong with that, my hope is that this video makes you look at lighting in a whole new way. 
Cinematographers have a way of manipulating, augmenting, and simulating natural light in such a way that looks natural yet stunningly beautiful. In this video, we faked sunlight and moonlight and created light that appeared to come from practical lamps. We also looked at how bouncing light off many different surfaces could create dramatic results. Bounced light is so overlooked, but so common in nature. In closing, I would like to encourage you to look at the light around you for inspiration and to also watch a whole lot of movies. Notice how all the different genres of movies have different lighting styles that fulfill a different emotional purpose. I like to rent movies and pause and study them whenever I see something that catches my eye. There are also great places online that have screen grabs for movies with wonderful cinematography. Look at them and think about the color, the intensity, the angle, and the quality of light and how you might create that look in your photography. I hope you enjoyed this first video on lighting like a cinematographer. If you want more, then head on over to our website at digitalberet.com and sign up for our e-news updates. That way, we can let you know whenever we release new material. Our goal is to make more training videos like this in the future, as well as add some quick tips and tutorials on our blog. So now, go out, light, shoot, and create some awesome cinematic photographs. Until next time, I'm Joel Dreyer with Digital Beret Studios. Thanks so much for watching. The fulfilling and emotional purpose is the key here. When a when a lighting, when a lighting you see that. It's a Mario. All right. The fulfilling and emotional purpose is the key here. When a lighting. When you a lighting. I'll be back here spinning a piece. You understand? Luigi. Sorry.